Buongiorno a tutti. Um, my name is uh, Ara Pulido. I work for a company called Datadog. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about observability, what it is and, or what I think it is, and how it's a little bit different when you want to try to implement it for serverless workloads. A um, couple of things. When I talk here about serverless, I'm mainly talking about function as a service, particularly on public clouds. And just a disclaimer, um, this talk itself is not about Datadog, but just so you know, Datadog is a monitoring as a service company that, among other things, help companies improve the observability of their systems. Um, I'm a developer advocate at Datadog, and that's my Twitter account and my mail. Feel free to ask any questions there. Uh, DMs are open, so if you have any questions afterwards, you can grab me around, but if you can't today, um, you, can, you can ask questions there. Um, so first of all, what is observability? Uh, so it feels like it's yet another buzzword that we are adding to the pool of already a lot of buzzwords that we have. So now we have microservices, containers, and big data, ML, CICD, function as a service, serverless, and it feels like yet we are in another one. Um, but I think the main difference between observability and the rest of the words is that observability is a little bit of a consequence of the rest. And I'm going to explain why with a little bit of history. Um, so not long ago, this is how we built all of our applications. So this is the monolith, famous monolith, where you have all the logic in one chunk, and you have a database where you store um, your state. And it made sense to build applications this way because when we didn't have cloud, public clouds, when we didn't even have virtualization, we have to wait for weeks or months to get a new server, as Jan explained. Uh, so it made sense to optimize to have everything in one place. And it's still a very good architecture to build things quickly. If you want to just prototype something quickly, it's still a very good way to, to do your applications. Um, so back then, uh, when we built all our applications that way and virtualization was only starting, um, the user expectations were completely different as well. So I don't know if you remember this page, if you're old enough and you like pictures and you like photos. Uh, you may remember this is, was the maintenance window page for Flickr. Flickr is a photo sharing service. And in case you cannot read it, I'm going to read it for you. It says, Flickr is down for planned maintenance and will be back with the usual foot of goodness at 1 p.m. Um, so a couple, two things to notice here. So first of all, this, this wasn't unplanned. It wasn't uh, just an audit that they had. It was completely planned. And second thing, they knew more or less how long it was going to take. Uh, in this case, check at 1 p.m. Obviously, I use the expectations today are completely different. Um, now technology is completely embedded into our daily lives. Let's imagine that you're in the middle of the pouring rain and you want to get a taxi and you grab your phone, open the taxi app, and then you say, oh, our taxi app is down for maintenance, check in three hours. Like, no way, that cannot happen. But back then, could happen. This was more or less 10 years ago when we started to change things a little bit. So back then, having basic infrastructure monitoring was enough. So especially because of that type of technology and also though that type of user expectations, um, you could normally just set out a set of alerts based on CPU usage, for example, or just get some pings against your server and while it pings back, it's all okay. And suddenly you, don't, you get an alert because something is not responding and you would go to the server closet and see what's going on. Um, and maybe you need to order more memory or more or a new server, things like that. So with th those two things combined, um, this was mostly okay. Until things started to change and started to change a little bit on how us as a user um, see our applications that we are using. So this was again 10 years ago, so this was 2010. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, there was a time where Twitter was scaling very fast, not only in number of users, but also in, in number of teams and features that they wanted to deploy in production. Um, and this happened a lot. So every now and then, uh, you would go to Twitter and you would see the famous Twitter whale. 
and this was happening a lot. Um, so they had to fix something there. So that's when we started creating applications a different way with different architectures, in this case, microservices. The, one of the main advantages that microservice architectures have is that, in my opinion, you can scale a team a lot better. So if, you, if you're growing your team very, very fast, um, and you're using a monolith architecture, everybody's going to try to add features at the same time. And when you go to production, things may or may not well uh, go as, as expected. With microservices, teams can individually own a set of d development, a set of services, and also the production services. So they can independently decide when they want to add new features, how they want to deploy them, um, and how they're going to run them in production. Um, this is the main, one of the main advantages of microservices, but also it has a, a little bit of a downside that infrastructure monitoring is no longer enough. Um, this is a tweet, it's a joke from 2015, so more or less in the middle of that transition. Um, and it says, we replace our monolith with microservices so that every outage could be more like a modern mystery. Um, so obviously this is a joke, uh, but I think it holds some truth in it. And I think the, the truth that it holds uh, is that if you don't know how your service is running, if you don't understand your system while it's behaving in theory as the user expected, once something goes wrong, it's already too late. It's going to, to be very difficult to solve very quickly what's going wrong, to understand what's going wrong. And this is why we needed to change the way we understand our systems in production. And that's where observability comes into place. And observability comes from control theory. It doesn't come from software. And the definition of observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. What does this mean? So what it means is that based on the data that your system provides to you, um, how well are you going to be able to understand that system? Uh, and it's, it, it's a big difference between monitoring and observability. Monitoring is an action, it's a verb. It's something that you do as an operations team, you monitor your systems. Observability, in, uh, in this case, is a quality. It's an adjective. It's something your system has to have in order for you to be able to understand the system, in order to you to be able to answer those questions that you may have about the system. So how we start getting that information back from our system. So this is where most people start uh, when they want to improve observability in their system. So they start with logs, metrics, and tracing. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into these three. But it can be anything else that can help you. All the, all the information that you can get um, and all the tools that you can get to understand your system better. So it can be events. So for example, um, when you deploy code into, into production, that's an event, and it can help you understand um, how your system is running. It can be ML or data visualizations, uh, things that help you understand the data that you're getting from the system. Uh, it can be browser testing, user testing, how my users are actually experiencing the, my system. It's also information that can be helpful um, when something goes wrong. Um, also queries, how can I query the data that is coming from, uh, from my system in a way that is, I'm successful? Um, so all of this can improve observability on your system. Um, so what happens when we're trying to implement all these things in serverless? So serverless system has some qualities that make them a little bit different. First of all, you don't have access to the underlying OS. So, and because you don't have access to the OS, you cannot deploy uh, a random agent that is collecting information for you. Um, also, in many clouds, uh, the runtime, the whatever runs your function, is a little bit of a black box. You don't know exactly what's going on. And that's a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. It's something, uh, us, as a developer, I just want to get my code, put it somewhere, and get it run. I don't want to, to understand what's going on behind the scenes. But it has some consequences that we will be talking about. 
and also you're charged by execution time and allocation of CPU memory. So you want to make sure that you don't bloat your function a lot, so because you want to get your costs down. So how we are going to do it? Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be using a demo application that I built. Um, it's, on, it's in GitHub. This is a URL to GitHub in case you want to check it out and, and see the code. Um, it's, it's, um, it's built on AWS and Python, but it's, what I'm going to be talking about is generic. It's quite generic, so you can, you can apply it to whatever cloud you're using. And we are going to see how we are going to start adding logging metrics and tracing to that, to that app. Um, the demo application itself is a face recognition application, so the idea as a user is that you upload a picture and it's going to tell you um, whether that picture has a face and if it's the first time that that's, it's seen that face and, or whether it doesn't, or it's going to error if there is no faces or more than one face or it's a duplicate face. Um, I'm going to show quickly a video on how this works as a user, so here I'm uploading a picture with multiple faces, and it's going to give an error about, hey, this is more than one face, I don't like it. Then uh, with no faces at all, so it's just a landscape, and it's going to err again, saying, okay, I cannot see a face here. Uh, then I'm going to upload a picture of myself, and it's going to say, okay, this is a face, this is the first time that I see this face, so I'm going to index that face. And then I'm going to upload a second picture of myself. This time it's darker, no makeup, and, but it still is going to recognize that that was the face um, that I'd seen before, and it's going to err as a duplicate. So this is more or less um, the application. And this is the, the architecture of the application. Uh, it uses an AWS service called Recognition for the recognition of faces. But basically, the architecture is um, EC2 instance, so a web app in Flask, um, that is going to run some functions. So the first one is going to detect whether it can see a face or not. The second one is going to search for duplicates. And if it doesn't find any duplicate, it's going to return to the user at that point that everything is OK. And it's going to do some work asynchronously. So using SQS, it's going to index the face so the next time it finds a duplicate. And it's going to proceed some data into a DynamoDB. It's going to basically the, the index ID of the face and the username, um, the, the person who uploaded that face. So it's a very, as you can see, it's simple application, but it's uh, hybrid enough so it, it can help as a, as a valid use case. So how, where do we start? So I think if you want to start adding observability to your system, start with logs. Why? Because it's super simple for any um, cloud to add logging to serverless. It's completely transparent to the user. Uh, so the platform is going to log anything that you print. By default, it's going to log anything that you print to a standard out or a standard error. So log as much as possible. So any information that you can see uh, that might be helpful in the future, start creating those logs. The good thing is that you don't have to actually use the log indexing system of your platform because you can use something called log forwarders that are basically Lambda functions that it's basically checking all the time for new logs in your cloud logging system and it send them elsewhere, whatever log platform that you're using. And also you don't have to just use print a standard out a standard error. You can use your language logging library um, and in general, it has very good support in, in cloud platforms. So this is what I did, for example. Uh, this is my, one of my functions. This is the one that persists the data into DynamoDB. And every time that I do that, I want to make sure that I have a log about what did I did. Um, so as you can see, I didn't have to do anything. It's just normal Python. I just did uh, import logging, which is the standard library in Python for logging, uh, set the level to info, and my Lambda, the, the cloud platform on the background without me having to do anything is going to send that to their um, cloud logging system. And then using a log forwarder, I'm going to send it that log entry elsewhere. Um, so in this case, this is how that same log entry is in CloudWatch. Um, and thanks to the log forwarder, I'm sending that log to, to Datadog in my case. 
uh, it's exactly the same one, and everything happens on the background without having to, nothing is happening on your function at that point. So, yeah, logs, simple. Metrics. So the first thing to talk about metrics is how we are going to collect metrics in a serverless world. So how we do collect metrics in general when we are talking about VMs. Uh, what we do is to um, all these data points with a timestamp that we want to collect about our system, we start collecting them and then we are going to send them in batches to our um, metric system. Why we do that? Because we don't want to, every time that we collect a metric, create an API call to send them elsewhere. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, can we do the same with, with serverless? Uh, so this is how uh, serverless context, execution context work. We have what we call the call star, which is basically when uh, you run your function for the first time after a while, uh, it's going to take a little bit longer it's because that's, that's where the cloud platform is going to build the execution context the thing that runs your function, it can be a container, it can be something else, you don't care, but it's, it's the time where it's going to build that for you, allocate that for you. Um, and uh, then it's going to reuse that same execution context for a while. So the next invocations are going to be a little bit faster, what we call a warm start, because the execution context is already available. And one of the good things about execution context is uh, the disk uh, is kept through invocations. So this is an optimization that our clouds provide, so you can do things faster um, if you want to. So we could say, okay, let's do the same thing. Let's keep those metrics on disk, and then from time to time we are going to send them in batches. Problem, again, the black box. Um, it's a little bit of a black box also. We don't know when those things are going to be garbage collected in general. So you cannot trust that the execution context is going to be there for the next invocation, for the one that is going to send the metrics in batches. So if you do this way, you risk losing data. Um, and depending on your use case, it may be okay to lose data. It depends. In general, it's not, but it depends. So if you do that, you have to take into account that you may lose data. So what's an alternative? It's using logs. Again, logs is the best thing for serverless right now in terms of observability. Um, you can add them as logs, your metrics. So you can basically create a metric that is actually a log entry and then get a log forwarder to understand that that's a metric, not a log entry, and send them to your metric system. Um, this is what what I do in this example, so I have a log entry that says I want to track how many images I find with multiple faces. Um, so basically what, I, what I'm he doing here is, okay, metric name in a JSON format, metric name, a value, um, a timestamp, and a set of tags. Um, and then my, a log forward is going to send them to my metric system. Uh, in this particular case, you can do this by just creating that log, um, in my case, I'm using a Lambda layer uh, that uh, Datadog has. Uh, it's open source. That basically does that for you. Um, and that way, I can make sure that I'm not losing any data and that things are happening be behind the scenes. I don't, it's not part of my function. So once we know how we are going to collect the metrics, uh, what are the metrics that we should be collecting for our serverless systems? So when we start thinking about collecting metrics for infrastructure, usually, uh, if you read about it everywhere, almost, people talk about what we call the four golden signals, which is, are basically latency, traffic, saturation, and errors. Uh, latency is the amount of time it takes for your system to do work. Uh, traffic is the amount of, of work that your system can handle in a period of time. Saturation is the contrary, is the, the amount of work that your system cannot handle. And errors is any errors that happen in the process. And in general, when we try to translate that into serverless, uh, we have equivalents um, in, in cloud platforms. In general, we talk about duration for, for um, functions, so that would be the latency. Uh, number of invocations, uh, it would be the equivalent to traffic. 
uh, throttle, which is the number of, of uh, as Jan said, you have a number of concurrent functions that you can have. If you go uh, above that level, it's going to be rejected. That's, that's when we say some functions uh, were throttle, some function invocations, and then errors matches um, straight away. So like any other system, uh, it's a good, good way is by starting with the four golden signals. But once you have the four golden signals getting data from your system, you may want to also get metrics, infrastructure metrics that are very specific to your serverless architecture. So you may want to start collecting uh, cold stars versus warm stars. So how many cold stars are you getting in your system versus warm stars? And the difference between the latency on those two. Um, also, uh, you may want to track things like build duration versus duration. So in many public clouds, uh, your functions get charged every 100 milliseconds. So if, you, if you're running your function for 110, you may get charged by 200. So you may want to track the difference between that build duration that that function had versus the actual duration that they have, because it may give you some ideas of where to optimize. So if you're getting very high difference between those two numbers, you may want to, to try to, in a particular function, you may want to try to optimize that function. Another way, another metric interesting to save money um, is the estimated cost per function. So you're, you're tracking all this over time. And you may want to track this over time and do some experiments or changing or getting a bigger function allocation, so bigger CPU and bigger memory. Why you want to do that? Uh, because it's a little bit counterintuitive, but in many cases, or in some cases, um, getting a bigger function allocation gets your cost down. Why is that? Um, the reason is because, uh, for example, if you, in this example is AWS, um, if you're running a 128 megabyte function for 700 milliseconds, it's going to cost you more or less the same as running 300, 320 megabytes for 300 milliseconds. But when you do bigger memory allocation, you're also doing bigger CPU allocation. That may happen that your, your function runs quicker or your function uh, doesn't get timeouts, et cetera, et cetera. So actually your costs go lower or at least they stay more or less the same and your users are getting a better experience. And, and Alex is going to talk a little bit more about optimization of, of function size um, later on. So he's, he's going to, to talk a bit more about that. So that's for infrastructure metrics. Uh, what about business metrics? So business metrics is anything that is not infrastructure, but it also helps improve your business. So for example, if you're, if you're working for a bookshop, uh, the number of items in the car that people have uh, in the car before they check out is a business metric. It's not something that helps you run the infrastructure of your service, but it helps you improve your business. One of the problems that happen with business metrics is that sometimes they are a little bit difficult to identify. But the good thing is that serverless architectures help us identify those. Because each function that you're running in your system is a potential business metric. Um, so at least one, maybe two, but at least one. So think about your architecture as a way to understand how you should be tracking your system, your business. This is what I do on my, on my example application. So um, I have a function that checks for duplicate faces. And I say, OK, if I have a function that checks for duplicate faces, this might be a metric that I want to track. So I'm tracking that. Same thing for images without faces or the sum of images index. So for every function that I have, I say, OK, probably this is a business metric that is value. Um, finally, uh, tracing. What is tracing and a specific particular uh, distributed tracing? So. When you have a microservice architecture, when a user makes a request, the latency that they, that they experience is actually a compound of the latencies that happen in your system. So in this case, in this example, service one is calling service two, that calls service three, 
uh, that calls for M5 and then goes back to the user. So this is the main definition that you can find for, for trace and span. So the trace would be the whole request, the, the thing that happens since the user makes a request and gets a reply, and that's a trace. But that trace is compounded by different spans that happen on each of those services. And having distributed tracing can help you in two ways. Can help you if you want to, to improve performance of, the, of, the, of a request, you may want to know where that performance is coming from. So if you have several services, some that may be taking more time than another. And same thing to find errors. When something goes wrong in a service, it's important information where that call was coming from, what was the part of all that trace. And that's what distributed tracing helps you doing. How do we do distributed tracing? So um, you basically have to instrument your code. Uh, you have to add some library that basically what it does is going to add a trace ID uh, for every uh, service call that you make. So basically that gets the connection together. And then there is, a, there is an agent that basically collects that and together. Problem, we don't have an OS, so no way to add an agent. So several solutions here. Uh, you can use cloud-specific libraries and tools uh, because, as a, because the platform basically can do a lot more than external tools in the sense that they understand, they know what's going on behind the scenes. <coughs> Sorry. And this is, for example, uh, what AWS does with X-Ray. So they, they provide a set of libraries to do, uh, to instrument your code for tracing, and they start creating those trace ID be between your serverless calls. A little bit something to take into account if you do that, that you have to make sure that you don't break your current trace. Distributed tracing is only useful if you actually can connect all the dots together. If you can get a trace that is actually the request that the user is seeing. In many cases, in many of our applications, we don't have a full serverless uh, platform. We have set up, in this case, we have um, an EC2 instance that collects, and it's, that's the first part of the request. So you have to make sure that the tools that you're using uh, are able to connect all the dots together. Um, this is, for example, the, the full app trace uh, for my application, uh, as seen on Datadog. And you can see that everything is connected together. The, the thing that happens on EC2 is uh, this is a full trace, um, the latency that the user is seeing. Uh, and um, this is basically the first uh, function that we have. This is the second one. And then at that point, uh, it, it returns something to the user. And there is some background uh, other two functions that we saw happening on the, uh, asynchronously. And you can see it's no longer part of the latency that the user is experiencing, but it's still part of the same, the same trace. So this is very important that you are able to, to connect everything. Um, you can also get um, a little bit of an idea of the, of the performance of your application in a way that you can see where to optimize. If you're not able to, to, to use something like S-Ray, um, you can use logs, a little bit more difficult, uh, but that's something that we are experimenting as well in Datadog. Uh, so we just, uh, a couple of weeks, we released another, an, an improvement of a, of a Lambda layer that actually does this. So instead of if doing something that the cloud uses, we use logs to create that trace ID that it connects the dots together. So definitely a little bit more difficult than, than the metrics case, but it still logs, as you can see, um, can help you a lot. So very high level things that you need to start considering when you want to improve observability on your serverless system. So we've seen how to add logs, metrics, and tracing, um, some takeaways. Uh, logs are cheap, log a lot. Cheap in the sense that it's super transparent. It's, it doesn't cost you um, like your, your function uh, latency at all. It doesn't affect your latency, so log a lot. And then 
uh, you can you don't have to use the cloud or you don't have to index everything that you're logging you can select afterwards with log forwarders with other tools what you want to keep for a long time you can use logs for things that are unexpected like using for metrics or even for tracing um, also take the opportunity to have a serverless architecture to to track your business metrics and for tracing make sure that your trace is complete. The trace is everything, all the services, containers, EC2 instances or VMs or uh, functions that are part of your system and not only because if it's disconnected, it's no longer useful. Um, and that's it, thank you very much. Uh, We're hiring, so if you want to help us building better tools to improve observability on serverless architectures, let me know. Um, that's the link for the demo app again, if you want to, to have a look. And that's it. Thank you.